days it's just going to come out and we're going to call it Malachi because that's what I do and uh, it's um, I, I'm afraid that it's going to happen tonight that I'm going to refer to Malachi but Malachi um, that's the book that we're overviewing I want to do something maybe a little bit different these books that are so short I mean this is four chapters and that's not even really completely fair I don't think because chapter four is just really short so we'll read the whole book tonight and as we read through Malachi, I think what my, my plan is, this is what I would like to do. I would like to just give you the divisions of the book. Um, I didn't realize this. I've read through Malachi and I've, I've marked out. Here's the things that I had marked out in my Bible because this is what I notice about Malachi. God says something like in verse 2, I have loved you. But then the people say, um, but you say, how have you loved us? And then God says something else, but you say, how have we despised your name? I think there's eight different times in Malachi where you see that pattern. God says something, but the people say, they question it and they're, they're, they're mouthy about it in response. Um, but with those six, no, eight, with those eight different times, I think, let me make sure that that's right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now, I thought that might be the case. With the nine times that you see, but you say this, God says, but you say this, it was hard for me to understand the structure of the book. And so I looked at a couple of uh, Bible encyclopedia articles and a couple commentary entries on this. And it turns out that pretty universally, at least every resource that I have agrees that Malachi uh, divides up nicely into six major sections. And that was very helpful for me. It was really helpful for me to see the six major sections. And I marked them in my Bible. And what I did was I highlighted the, one, of the sec, one of the pieces of words in those sections that's going to serve as my, as my uh, main heading for each of the sections and it helps us to read and so part one of what we're going to do tonight is we're just going to read through this book and i want to show you the sections and maybe summarize what this section is about so it makes it helpful to read it with understanding part two though and this is this is what you could do uh, these lessons are intended to be like an overview of the book to help us understand what the book is but I think you could do this with Malachi with a sermon or a class. In each of these sections, there are so many good lessons. I mean, good, good lessons for life, for, for us. And so even though I'm not going to dive into each of these lessons, I at least want to point you to them. And then this is kind of what I would like. If, if I get a say in what you do, with this material, uh, we mark out the sections, we understand what's going on with the book of Malachi, and then you go home tonight and you open up Malachi and you talk about it and you say, okay, so what's going on here and what are the lessons that we can get from that? Um, so uh, I, I give you the tools to read the book uh, in an effective way and then you read the book in an effective way and come up with some good lessons. Um, just one thing about Malachi, we don't really have any solid way of knowing where Malachi falls in the history that we're doing. I put Malachi right about here after the time of Nehemiah. But so there's a priesthood and there's a temple that he's dealing with. So you know that it has to be at least after this period of time. That's really the only indication that we have of where Malachi falls, other than that, Ezra and Nehemiah both are about the same period of time. I mean, they're a couple years separated from each other. And they deal with some things like um, the people and tithing. Tithing is a major problem in Malachi, and it's a major problem with, with Nehemiah especially. 
And there are these sin problems that pop up, which that's kind of general because all of God's people always deal with sin. But there is specifically a marriage issue that pops up in Malachi. Um, we'll look at that a little bit later. One of our six sections is specifically about this marriage issue. And both Ezra and Nehemiah address the marriage issue. And so you, I don't have an answer for you on this. You're just going to have to figure it out for yourself what you think or, or just leave it kind of up in the air. Maybe Malachi is contemporary with these guys and... He's writing about the same time as them. And so that's the reason why there's a lot of the same problems with Ezra and Nehemiah and Malachi. I tend to think that it's something more like this. This is only an opinion. Don't, this is not any sort of gospel and there's no verse that I can point you to, to, to say this, but I tend to think Ezra and Nehemiah did their work and enough time passed that the same problems popped up again. And Malachi is doing exactly what the story of the Bible has been uh, from day one. We're just dealing with the same stuff over and over and over again. And so uh, that's how I kind of place Malachi. Um, but you can do that. Let's start. Let's start reading. This is going to be our first section. Chapter 1 and verses 2 and 5. And if this is helpful for you at all, maybe you don't write in your Bible, that's cool. But what I do is next to verse 2, I just write 1 slash 6. So this is the start of the first of six sections in the book of Malachi. Verse 1, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Um, and so let me just tell you what I've done here. I made a little highlight I, and orange is my section color. It helps me to see big sections and meaning. So what I did in my Bible was on verse two, where God says the words, I have loved you. That is the main point of this first section. God is telling this group of people, Israel, I have loved you and they shoot back mouthy. Incidentally, let me just throw this one out. This is one of our practical lessons. Um, our kids do this to us sometimes, and we don't like it. Whenever we say something to our kids, and our kids shoot back, and they're like, Yeah, but how have you done that? This is what I said to do. When did you say to do that? It's easy to point the finger at our kids and say, you should not talk to me like that. It's not so cute or funny when adults do it, and it's especially not cute when they do it to God. And so the mindset is, let's not have this nasty, controversial kind of attitude towards God. So verse 2, God says, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? And here is God's answer. Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, Edom and Esau are the same. Esau is the person and Edom is the country that came from him. Verse 4. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of hosts says, they may rebuild, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. So the main point is that God says, I have loved you. And Israel responds, how have you loved us? And God says, you're here, aren't you? Esau is not here. I have destroyed them. And what's left of them, I'm going to destroy. But you are here. And not only that, but this kingdom that you are a part of, it's going beyond the border of Israel. So this is going to be section number one. God says, I have loved you. And the way that God says, I have loved you, is that he says, you're here, aren't you? And then this is what I would like for you to do with this lesson. I'd like for you to talk about this or to think about this with your family 
and, and say, what do, you know, how can we use something like this? And what do we take away from a lesson like this? It probably will redefine the way that we think about our complaining. Because every single thing that I have in my life, every, every possession that I have, every person that I love, every relationship, this congregation, it's all from the Lord and it's all a reflection of his love for me. And whenever I complain about anything, it's kind of like me saying, but how have you loved me? I don't have anything. What have you done good for me? God says, look at your life. I've done a lot of stuff good for you. And this is how you know that I love you. So you can see some practical value in that, I think, in what we do. Okay, the second section is a little bit longer. This is going to be chapter 1 and verse 6, all the way down through chapter 2 and verse 9. And one of the things that happens in this section, you can see it, I guess, in verse 6 is that God is addressing the priest specifically. This, by the way, is how we know that the temple was rebuilt and that the priesthood was restored. It gives us a little bit of indication about where Malachi is. In verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his mother. If then I am a father, where is my honor? That's what I call the second section. The second section is God asking the question to Israel, where is my honor? How, how come you don't respect me? He says, if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts? To you, O priest, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? And this is the answer. Polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? And this is the answer. By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. Let's just give God our garbage. Let's give God our, our junk that we weren't going to use anyway. And they say, well, how have I given you my junk? By saying that it doesn't matter that you just give God your seconds and your junk. In verse 8. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to you. With such a gift from your hand, uh, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. Um, that verse is really something. Can you just stop and read that verse slowly and hear what God says? If you're going to do nothing but offer me your seconds and your junk, I wish that there was somebody among you who would just close the doors of the temple and you wouldn't give me anything at all. That's what I would prefer. That's what God says in this section. Uh, picking up in verse 10. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. This is God saying to Israel, you cannot be bothered to give me anything other than your animals that were worthless and dying in the first place. But God's response to these priests to Israel who won't offer their best to God is to say, I will be regarded as holy. The nations will treat me as holy. They will worship me, even if you won't. In verse 12, but you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. Now think about that. God says, I don't want your seconds. I want your very best. And now Israel's response is, oh, this is too much. 
What a, what a hassle. What a weariness this is, God, that you just keep asking all of this stuff from us. In verse 13, but you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick. And this you bring as your offering? Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has made male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Chapter 2 and verse 1. We're keeping the thought going because he's still talking to the priest. And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your, off, uh, of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. He turned many from iniquity. This is what Israel should have been. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge. The people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despise and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. Okay. The main thought of section two is God saying, where is my honor? And he's talking to the priest, and he says to the priest, this is the way that it should have been, and this is what you should have been teaching the people, but you failed, and because of that, I'm going to punish you. And the, the main thing that the priest should have been teaching the people in that we honor God is that we, as God's chosen people, should willingly, but have no choice at the same time, offer our very best to God. God does not, it certainly doesn't need our seconds in our garbage, but he doesn't want our seconds and our garbage. What God wants is our honor. And so that's your conversation when you go home with this. How do we honor God? How do we give him our first fruits and our very best? And how do we sometimes skimp and not give him everything that he deserves? Number three. Let me pull that up on the board here. Number three is going to be chapter two and verses 10 through 16. This is the marriage section that I was talking about earlier. Um, let me just go ahead and tell you at the front of this. Well, let's read verse 10 so you can see. We have not, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another? That's going to be my heading. Why then are we faithless to one another? And God is going to say, I have two problems with you in terms of your faithfulness or your faithlessness. I have two problems with you. Number one, you still are involved in these foreign marriages and marrying the people of the land. We saw that in Ezra and Nehemiah. And number two, not only are you connecting yourself with people that you should not be connecting yourself with, your own spouse, your own wife that you have, that you should be faithful to and holding on to, you're not faithful to that spouse. And you just put them away lightly. And so the idea here is faithlessness, generally. But here's the question that I want you to think about. Yes, this is about marriage and foreign marriages and, and divorce. 
But I wonder if this is really about marriage or if this is God talking about Israel's relationship with him. You constantly substitute me with something else and the relationship that you have with me, you, you run off and you don't maintain the faithfulness of this relationship. Read it and see what you think. Verse 10. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another? Profaning the covenant of our fathers. Judah has been faithless and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord which he loves and has married the daughters of a foreign God. There it is. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Verse 13. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Why doesn't God accept our offering? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. There it is. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. You're not going to have godly offspring if you don't have this godly Union, this godly marriage that you stay faithful to. This is what God wants. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. And the ultimate picture here in this third section of faithlessness is don't connect yourself to other gods who are not God and don't disconnect yourself to the one true God that we're supposed to be faithful to. Faithlessness is the problem. Okay, number four of six. This is going to be chapter two and verse 17. Down to chapter 3 and verse 5. Verse 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words. But you say, how have we wearied him? This is God's answer. By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? That's, that's what I called this one. Where is the God of justice? This is the problem in this fourth section. You've got a group of people who look at evil in the world around them and they say, that's good. And they look at good and they say, that's evil. And here they, they're confused about what's right and what's wrong. And then on top of that, as if that's not enough, they criticize God and they say, where is the God of justice in all of this? And you can almost imagine God looking down at them saying, the God of justice, you're calling evil good and good evil. Don't talk to me about justice. But this is what they do. And they say, where's God? Why doesn't God do anything about all the evil in our world that we see happening among us? In verse 1 of chapter 3, behold, this is God's response. Where is the God of justice? This is going to sound familiar to you. And I want you to hear what he's going to say. I want you to hear the context. God is going to say, I'm going to do something about justice. You want to know where the justice is? I'm going to do something about justice. But listen to what God says he's going to do about it. Behold, I will send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Does that sound familiar? That's the John the Baptist verse that's quoted in the New Testament. I will send my messenger and he's going to prepare the way for me when I get ready to come and do justice. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? 
And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. You're standing there saying, give me justice, give me justice. And God says, I'm going to send someone who's going to prepare the way for my justice. And when the Lord comes to do the justice, there's not a single person who's going to be able to stand and to face it. It's like the main point of this one is you best be careful what you ask for. Especially if you're calling good evil and evil good. Verse 3. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord. As in the days of old, as in former years. Just in case you don't know about this. The refiner's fire and the fuller soap. That is not a pleasant process. In verse 5, then I will draw near to you for judgment. This is the judgment you've been asking for. I will be swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers. Remember he just condemned these same people. The adultery thing. Against those who swear falsely. Against those who oppress the hired worker and his wages. The widow and the fatherless. Against those who thrust aside the sojourner. And do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. So... Here's the key, and we're going we're gonna to go ahead and deal with this now instead of waiting till the end of the lesson. Uh, because I've tried in each of these books to at least point at one stage of the book to Jesus. And here's Jesus. you got a group of people who say, where is the Lord's justice? And God says, I'm sending my justice. And the thing that he specifically points to is Jesus. And Jesus is the one who is going to execute this judgment against these people who are not faithful to God. Jesus is the answer to God's justice. Incidentally, side note, maybe you can have a conversation about this. There's a whole lot of talk in our world right now about justice and social justice, and we want justice and all kinds of justice. There is no justice without Jesus. End of story. That is the place, that is the place where you find reconciliation with God and because of God with man. It's only through Christ. Okay, number five. Verses six through 12. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. God has always been merciful. From the days of your father's You have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you. That's what I highlighted as the section of this. Where's the justice? God says, I'm sending the justice and it's not going to work out for you. But God says, I have always been a merciful and gracious God. And so this is my call for you right now. Come back to me and I will come back to you. And then the whole justice thing doesn't turn into such a big deal for us anymore. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and your contributions. Here we are again, not giving to God what he deserves. You are cursed with a cursed for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. And so the idea is, God says, I want you to give me your very best. And you can imagine the person saying back to God, but I need this stuff. I can't give you my very best because I need it. And God says, that's not how I've always worked. You give me your very best and you watch what I'll pour out on you. Blessings like you can't even imagine. I think if we think of this in spiritual terms, it makes even more sense with Christianity. Verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine and the field shall not fail to bear says the Lord of hosts then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight says the Lord of hosts just just give me what 
is due to me, God, the creator of all things, and I'll take care of you. That's the point. Number six, this is the last section of Malachi, except for a conclusion, but this is the last section of, of Malachi. Chapter 3 and verse 13, and we'll go down uh, through chapter 4, I think in about verse 4. Is that right? Yeah. I'll throw that up there so I don't forget. We're not going to get to the main point of this one until later. I haven't forgotten it. It's just later. Verse 13. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or walking as in the morning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to test and they escape. This is the question. Why would I serve God and make my life more difficult and give the best of my stuff to God when I look around at arrogant people and evildoers and they appear to be doing just fine? That's... That's the question, and God says, your words are hard against me when you say that. In verse 16, then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. This is what we should be doing and saying. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before them of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more, this is what I highlighted as the main theme for this section. You will see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. And this is one of your main takeaways from this lesson that you see over and over again. These people are living in the present. And they cannot understand why they would devote themselves entirely to God when they look around and they see wicked people who haven't and those wicked people are doing just fine. And this is God's answer again in this book. If you will just take the long view, the eternal view, and look past the nose on the end of your face, past this life, God says, you will see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Verse 1 of chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, um, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness, shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Why would I serve God? Because the wicked are going to eventually be destroyed. That's his answer. Don't be one of those. And then finally, we have um, a conclusion. And the conclusion, I think, is... A pretty awesome practical conclusion for us. I think in these three verses, God says two things. See if you can find the two things and summarize them. Verse 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. That's another New Testament reference to John the Baptist who's going to come before Jesus. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and their hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. God finishes the book of Malachi with two things. He says, this is, this is what you need to know. Number one, do my law. Remember my law. Observe my commandments. Do the things that I told you to do. And get yourselves and your families right as best as you possibly can. This last statement. This is what John the Baptist is going to do to get us ready for Jesus. Turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of their children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land. Um, it's the same thing that we talked about a little bit 
in our Genesis study with Noah. What do you do when the flood comes? Get yourself and your family right and build an ark. That's what Malachi says. Get yourself and your family right to the best of your ability and do the law. Okay, I think that that is everything that I want to say about Malachi. Um, you can make fun of me if you want, but here's my one sentence summary of Malachi. It's more than one sentence, but here's what I did. I just took the six sections and the words that we pulled from each of these six sections and I formed it into one multi-sentence summary of Malachi. This is what God says in this book. I love you, but you do not honor me and are not faithful, so I will execute my justice. If you return to me, I will return to you and bless you, for I will distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. So do the law and get yourselves and your families in order. Malachi in a couple of sentences. If you're not a Christian and you're ready to start getting yourself in order because Jesus has made that possible for us, or I've not said this one in a while, maybe you are a Christian and you just need some help or some support or prayers from us, whatever it might be. Make your needs known. Let us know as together we stand and sing the invitation song.